Postal Telegraph, Hollywood, California, October 7th, 1933. Miss Mira Lafont, Care, Howard Strickling, MGM. The passing of your dear sister Rennie is a great loss to our industry, and her thousands of friends and admirers will never forget her. Please accept our sincere sympathy, said Grauman and Mother. Agreement for purchase of crypt. Hollywood Cemetery Association, 6000 Santa Monica Boulevard, Los Angeles, November the 23rd, 1933. I hereby subscribe for and agree to purchase one crypt, number 219, Corridor F, in the Hollywood Mausoleum, known as Corridor Unit F, together with ceiling, $12.50, two flower containers, $12.00, Bronze Memorial Tablet, $29.50, for which I promise to pay to the Hollywood Cemetery Association or its order at its office in the city of Los Angeles, California, the sum of $454 as follows. But if not so paid, I do agree to pay some in cash or installments to be agreed upon at the close of the estate of Rennie Adore, deceased. Mira Adore, care of Mr. Hankey. 117 West 9th, British Consulate, Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles Times, Friday morning, October 6, 1933. Hollywood mourns popular figure. Miss Adore loses fight with death. Funeral rites for French actress tomorrow to be conducted in Hollywood. A gallant fight to return to the heights of cinema fame, lost in death, René Adore. Petite French motion picture actress is to be laid to rest in the vault in the Hollywood Mausoleum tomorrow after her legion of friends who encouraged her pay their final respects. The funeral services are set for 11 a.m. in the Hollywood Cemetery Chapel with the Reverend James Hamilton Lash officiating. Death took Miss Adora yesterday at a little home in Tiyunga where she had gone to fight the ravages of a chronic respiratory ailment which she had thought had only temporarily halted her career in the cinema. Miss Adore, who rose to film fame after an obscure beginning with an itinerant circus, wanted to live most dearly to stage a comeback. And there wasn't a friend she had made during the success of her career who wasn't behind her in the fight. She had gone to Arizona in the beginning and had apparently won out for she returned six to eight months ago with high hopes. Yesterday morning at 7.30 o'clock, death struck suddenly and without warning. With her at the time was Antonia Ben Dixon, who remained beside her during her long fight, and her physician, Dr. Ernest H. King. Most grieved of all, perhaps, were Joan Crawford, Dorothy Sebastian, and John Gilbert, her friends for 10 years, for the four had formed a close comradeship during their film careers. It was with John Gilbert that she reached her pinnacle in The Big Parade, one of the outstanding films made about the First World War. An imposing list of names made up the honorary pallbearers for her funeral. These include Louis B. Mayer, Irving Thalberg, John Gilbert, Raymond Navarro, Harry Rapp, E. J. Mannix, Hunt Stromberg, Bernard J. Hyman, Lawrence Weingarten, M. E. Greenwood, King Vidor, Fred Niblo, Clarence Brown and George Hill, W.S. Van Dyke, Charles Braben, James A. Houlihan, Howard Strickling, Ralph Wheelwright, John Lancaster, Ralph Forbes, Gaston Glass, Lou Cody, Danny Danker, Clifford Robertson, Ivan St. John, Richard Hunt, Harrison Carroll, Herbert Howe, Reginald Barker, Edwin Shallot, and William L. Boyd. Miss Adore, born the September the 30th, 1898, commenced to fail in health while playing in Call of the Flesh. Like Barbara Lamar and Mabel Normand, Miss Adore kept the condition to herself and kept a smile for everybody, preferring to fight it out alone. Towards the end of the picture, her smile disappeared and she collapsed. After doctors told her that she must go away for a rest because tuberculosis had taken a heavy toll, she insisted on finishing the last scene. She never appeared before the cameras again. She remained on her back for two years in Arizona. Friends visited her weekly. She received fan letters continually. And this attention brought a turn for the better until the day she could walk. And she boarded a train for Hollywood with high hopes of returning to pictures. 
Then she had a relapse and was ordered to De Younger for a higher altitude. This seemed to strengthen her, and for a time it was believed that she could recover. Then death came unexpectedly. Miss Adore leaves a mother, Mrs. Victoria Adore, and her brother, who reside in London, England, and a sister, Mira, now with a theatrical company in Mexico City. She was born in Lille, France. Rennie performed in the circus as a dancer, acrobat, bareback rider and tableau model until the war, when she made her way to England. She went to New York, appearing on the stage, and finally won attention from films. The Free Press, published in the interests of Tionga Valley, Tionga, California, Thursday, October the 12th, 1933. Editor, Marshall Breeden. Facts, Fads and Fancies, by Daisy C. Breeden. In the final fade-out, Rene Dory was among friends. Although her mother, brother and stepbrother were thousands of miles away in London, although her friends of the screen were absent at the time of passing, she did not die alone. She died in the arms of a Tionga neighbour, Naomi Hughes. When she came to De Younger eight months ago, Miss Adore was happy in her selection of the little white house on Fairgrove, for Fairgrove Avenue harbours the kindest of folk. Up there on the hill, if one is sick, everyone is solicitous. If one is in sorrow, everyone is sad. If one is happy, everyone rejoices. The spirit that pervades that pepper tree lined street is untouched by petty or unfriendly strife. No stranger comes to live on Fairgrove or in its vicinity, but is welcomed and caught in the web of its infectious neighborliness, and so it was with Rennie. Respecting her need for privacy and quiet, they nevertheless showed her that she was in their thoughts by gifts of flowers, and for this gesture, her appreciation was more than they will ever know. Those into younger who knew her best were her immediate neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. J. L. Curran, and Naomi Hughes. The former she looked upon in the light of parents, affectionately calling them mom and daddy, while Naomi, who was as close to her as any of her older friends, was with her two or three times a day, sometimes even through the night when she needed her. No wonder Rennie refused to move at the suggestion of others. To younger can be friendly. The Friday before she died, Rennie was down at Naomi's beauty parlour, getting dolled up for her birthday on Saturday. I saw her there, an ethereally beautiful girl with dark eyes, flawless complexion and dark lustrous hair. She had insisted upon coming. Was she not going to have a birthday party dinner? Festive occasions must be met in a festive mood. When Saturday came, she donned her favourite outfit, velvet lounging pyjamas of royal blue, a gift from her friend John Gilbert, and sat down to the table with Tony Ben Dixon, her companion Naomi, and Mrs. Betty Janetsky, her nurse. She was gay and happy. Her wonderful sense of humour and her activity of mind stayed with her even to the very night before she died. She was game. Among those who gathered for the final farewell in Hollywood were some of the brightest lights of that glamorous city, they had remained her friends even through her dark times, Dorothy Sebastian, Jack Gilbert, Ernst Lubitsch, and Marion Davis, whose generosity had helped to alleviate the anxiety of her illness. But also included in the same throng was one whose loyalty and kindness had won her a place among Rennie's old friends, Naomi. I have written this little tribute to Rennie Adore in place of another story which she had promised to give when she felt equal to an interview. That story will not now be written. But since she was one of our readers, I think she would have been happy to know that in writing of her, I also wrote of the neighbors on Fairgrove Avenue. What I have felt about them, she had experienced. Knowing that she was surrounded by their thoughts of good, she realized that all she had to do was to call and they would answer. And that is just what happened. She was not disappointed. Rene Dory leaves six pound in cash. Her mother waits for news in a humble room at Brixton. 
In a humble apartment in Brixton, the grey-haired mother of René Dory, once famous in two continents as the star of the big parade, awaits news of her daughter's estate. René Dory died in a Los Angeles sanatorium three weeks ago after suffering for three years from tuberculosis. It was reported yesterday that she had left six pound in cash, 80 pound held in trust by a film studio and jewellery valued at 600 pound. I do not know what there is to come, said Miss Dory's mother, Mrs. Reeves, to a Daily Express representative last night. Only today I had a letter from my other daughter who flew from Mexico to attend Rennie's funeral asking me if she should sell the jewellery there. There are many people in Hollywood who would like to buy a souvenir of Rennie. I had not seen Rennie for ten years. She used to write to me often, and she used to send me money. Then three years ago the money stopped. Rennie had gone into a sanatorium. She always believed that she would get well. In the last letter I had from her she said, Mother darling, in two months I shall be back at work, and after that I shall be with you soon again in England. She dreaded only one thing, what she called those terrible arc lights. Since she went into the sanatorium, she had offers of film contracts from Germany and Paris. A lot of nonsense has been published about my daughter. Her real name was Reeves, although I was French and had Spanish or perhaps Portuguese blood in me. My husband was a Londoner, born and bred, a circus comedian with whom I travelled in many countries long before the war. It was I, not Rennie, who was the circus rider. I made my debut at Strasbourg in 1870 at the age of five. How they cheered! They gave me a laurel wreath so big that it framed me like a picture. Mrs. Reeves looks younger than her 69 years. She is a cheerful old lady. Her chief worries are the weather and her rheumatism. Thank you. 